Welcome to Lesson 15D, Normal Shocks. In this lesson, we'll discuss what happens across a normal shock, also called a normal shock wave. I'll give you a couple analogies, then I'll show you the equations for property changes across a shock, and I'll do an example problem. First, a qualitative discussion of a normal shock. Consider a converging-diverging nozzle with stagnation pressure and temperature in a large upstream tank. PB is back pressure and at some particular back pressure. Suppose we get a normal shock at this location. We always let one be upstream of the shock and two downstream of the shock. In this flow, we have sonic conditions at the throat or the minimum area. The flow is subsonic before the throat, supersonic after the throat, right up to the shock, and then subsonic again downstream of the shock. As previously, let's plot pressure as a function of x, where x is in the flow direction. We identify P0, the stagnation pressure, and P star, the sonic pressure. Pressure is P0 somewhere upstream of this converging region. It decreases to P star at the throat and continues to decrease up to the shock. At the shock, there's a sudden jump in pressure, and then the pressure rises after that, since the flow is now subsonic in a diverging duct. Similarly, let's plot Mach number as a function of x. Mach number starts at zero in the tank, reaches one at the throat, and then keeps increasing up to the shock. Across the shock, the Mach number must go below one, since the shock always goes from supersonic to subsonic flow. Downstream of the shock, Mach number decreases, since again, this is a subsonic diffuser, decreasing speed and Mach number, and increasing pressure. Let's examine this normal shock in some detail. I'll give some comments about a normal shock, which occurs in this diverging portion of the duct. First of all, Mach number 1 has to be supersonic, and MA2 has to be subsonic, as we've already stated. You cannot have a shock with a subsonic Mach number upstream. This would be impossible. Why? Well, you'd be violating the second law of thermodynamics, because entropy must increase across a shock. A shock is not isentropic. Shock location is determined by PB, the back pressure, for some fixed value of stagnation pressure, P0. If the shock is here at some PB, as PB goes down, the shock moves to the right. If PB is small enough, you can eventually have a shock at the exit plane, as we previously discussed. The larger Mach number 1 is, the stronger the shock, since Mach number increases through the supersonic portion of this diverging duct. As the shock moves downstream, it becomes stronger. What do we mean by stronger? The pressure ratio across the shock goes up as the shock increases in strength. The pressure rises suddenly across a shock. I put suddenly in quotes because nothing in nature is actually sudden. But the shock thickness is only a few microns. So we'll always assume that it's a sudden jump, ignoring the thickness of the shock. Temperature also rises suddenly across a shock, again in a distance of a few microns. Density also rises suddenly across a shock, as I illustrate here. Here are some examples of normal shocks. These are color Schlieren images. This picture shows a spherical shock after a balloon has burst. This is also called a blast wave. Region 1 is upstream of the shock, and region 2 is downstream of the shock. Again, there's a sudden pressure rise from 1 to 2. This picture shows a normal shock in the supersonic diverging portion of a converging diverging nozzle. In real life there are some boundary layer effects, which you can see here near the walls. The shock itself through the majority of the flow is nearly straight as we have sketched. In this case 1 is before the shock and 2 is after the shock. And the flow is from left to right as we've been sketching. Here's a qualitative summary of how properties change across a stationary normal shock. I show all these properties at 1, upstream of the shock, and at 2, downstream of the shock. These are the properties that increase across the shock. Pressure, temperature, therefore speed of sound, and specific enthalpy. Density, specific entropy, and it turns out that the sonic area also increases. These are the properties that decrease across the shock. Mach number, of course, since Mach number 1 is supersonic, and Mach number 2 is subsonic. Stagnation pressure decreases across a shock, as does stagnation density and speed, V. There are a few properties that stay the same. Stagnation temperature stays the same. 
since we're approximating this flow as adiabatic, stagnation-specific enthalpy also stays constant. Since H equals CPT, and H0 is equal to CPT0 for an ideal gas. Next, I want to give a couple analogies for a normal shock. The first is a traffic analogy. Suppose it's a foggy day on the interstate, and the salt truck suddenly stops. These cars are all moving at a constant speed, and time increases as we move down. The first car hits the truck, smashes its hood. Then the second car hits the first car, and crunches it a little more. And this keeps happening with all the cars. I drew a dashed red line where each car hits and gets smashed in the front. We can call this a traffic shock, and it moves to the left at some speed vs. I also drew a dashed blue line at the front of this blue car, just to show you that it's moving at a constant speed. In analogy to the shock, region 1 is upstream of the shock, and region 2 is downstream of the shock. The density of cars has gone up significantly, since they're all crunched together there's a sudden increase in car density, in analogy to a shock in air where there's a sudden increase of air density across the shock. Now imagine that you're moving with the shock. What would you see in a frame of reference moving with the shock? You'd see the cars moving towards the shock, and the wrecked cars also moving to the right but at a slower speed. This analogy may help you understand what's going on in a normal shock in a gas. Another analogy is the coin analogy. Imagine these rows of coins, which we start pushing at time zero by a piston at speed V2. At some later time, the piston has moved here, and the coins have started bunching up. We can think of this as a coin shock, with one upstream of the shock and two downstream of the shock. This shock moves at speed Vs, which is larger than V2. At a later time, the piston has moved farther to the left but the shock is moving far ahead of it since it's moving at a faster speed. Across this coin shock, we see a sudden rise in coin density from region 1 to region 2. I make some comments. The vertical red line is analogous to a moving normal shock wave, moving from right to left at speed Vs, where in this absolute reference frame V1 is 0. These coins are moving at V2, but the shock is moving at a faster speed Vs. The coins in region 1 don't know anything is happening until this shock hits them. Similarly, in a shock wave in air, the air in region 1 doesn't know anything is happening until the shock wave hits it. The same thing holds true for these cars. These guys are driving in the fog. They don't know there's a wreck until they hit this shock wave. In a frame of reference moving with the shock, the shock would be stationary. From this reference frame, V1 would equal Vs. These coins are moving to the right at speed Vs, since the shock is stationary in this reference frame. Again, the speed upstream of the shock is greater than the speed downstream of the shock. I set up a little experiment pushing some coins with my cell phone. The red line is the wavefront of the coins, which represents the shock. Regions 1 and 2 are analogous to the flow before and after this moving shock. Everything we've discussed so far has been qualitative. Now let's look at some of the equations across a normal shock. We're in a stationary shock frame of reference with the flow from left to right. Here are some of the equations across a shock, which I show without derivation. Stagnation temperature is one of the few things that remain constant across a shock. Here's an equation for Mach number 2 as a function of Mach number 1 and the ratio of specific heats. In our textbook, we give two different equations for P2 over P1, the ratio of pressures. You can see that since Mach number 1 is greater than Mach number 2, P2 over P1 is greater than 1. Pressure rises across a shock. We also give expressions for density ratio and temperature ratio. And finally, P02 over P01. Now I'll do an example problem where we use some of these equations. We have a large pressurized tank with stagnation conditions, T0 and P0, a converging diverging duct, where we give T0 and P0, we have a throat where sonic conditions occur, and at this particular back pressure, there's a normal shock at this location. We assume a well-insulated duct, and we ignore friction and boundary layers. We're asked to compare the Mach number, pressure, and temperature upstream and downstream of the shock. First, I list all the assumptions and approximations, ideal gas, steady, adiabatic, 
one-dimensional, isentropic upstream of the shock, isentropic downstream of the shock, but not isentropic through the shock. Specific entropy always goes up across the shock. To solve this problem, I first apply the area ratio versus Mach number relationship that we had from a previous lesson. I apply it just upstream of the shock at location 1. So I use area A1 and Mach number MA1. In this problem, the normal shock sits at a location in the diverging portion of the nozzle where the cross-sectional area is twice the throat area. So A1 over A star is 2. As we discussed in a previous lesson, we must solve this equation implicitly for Mach number 1. We get two roots. MA1 is 0 0.3059, which is the subsonic root, and 2.19720, which is the supersonic root. Since the flow is always supersonic upstream of the shock, we know that this root is not correct. So our first answer is that Mach number is 2.20, where I round all my answers to three digits, but I keep these extra digits so that when I plug this number into other equations, I don't get round off error. Now I can calculate P1 using the isentropic relationship, where as I mentioned previously, we are approximating the flow as isentropic up to the location of the shock. I write P1 equal P1 over P0 times P0, which I rewrite as P0 over P1 to the minus 1 times P0, since I have an expression for P0 over P1, the isentropic relationship from a previous lesson, namely 1 plus k minus 1 over 2 Mach number squared, times this exponent, which now has a negative sign, and that's multiplied by P0. I plug in my Mach number 1 and the given value of P0 I get this pressure to six significant digits, but again I report my answer to three significant digits, 93.9 kPa. Similarly, we can calculate T1 using the known T0 over T1 equation for isentropic flow. T0 was given as 800 K, again plugging in this Mach number, and a K of 1.40 for air. I get this temperature, which I report to three digits. Now let's use our equation for Mach number 2, namely this equation, which I rewrite here. Plugging in Mach number 1 and k, I get 0 0.54743, so I report Mach number 2 as 0 0.547. Notice that MA2 is subsonic as it must be. To get temperature T2, I use this equation and write T2 as a ratio T2 over T1 times T1 which is equal to this equation for T2 over T1 times T1. Again, I plug in MA1, MA2, K, and I use the T1 that I calculated previously. I get T2 is 755 K. Similarly, P2 is P2 over P1 times P1. I use this equation since I have MA2, but I could have used this equation also. You can double check and make sure they give you the same answer. From a previous calculation, P1 was 93.9326 kPa, and I report pressure 2 as 513 kPa. I did all these calculations in Excel, not just before and after the shock, but for the entire duct. I plot Mach number in blue and pressure in green. Here's my Mach number 1, my Mach number 2, pressure 1, and pressure 2. I could have made similar plots for temperature and density. I'll make a few comments about this plot. This location is the throat where the Mach number is 1. The pressure here would be P star. Everything to the left of the throat is subsonic. To the right of the throat, the flow is supersonic, up to the shock. But across the shock, the Mach number suddenly drops from supersonic to subsonic. So downstream of the shock, the flow is once again subsonic. I sketch the nozzle with the shock. This region of the flow is a subsonic nozzle. The walls are converging. The Mach number increases and the pressure decreases. This region is a supersonic nozzle. The Mach number keeps increasing and the pressure keeps decreasing. But once we go across the shock, the flow is subsonic, so we have a subsonic diffuser. Since it's a diverging duct, pressure rises downstream of the shock and Mach number decreases downstream of the shock. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.